Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about one more video this week uh, from, again, John Swed, Jazz 101, A Complete Guide to Learning and Loving Jazz. Once again, I encourage you to check out uh, Swed's writing and his research. He's one of the best. This is in regards to the third uh, video on our YouTube playlist for week one, uh, Bill Evans' trio, Witchcraft, from the recording Portrait in Jazz. Piano trios before Bill Evans have usually been less a trio than a pianist, accompanied by drums and bass. Evans had just recorded Kind of Blue with Miles Davis shortly before he took bassist Scott LaFaro and drummer Paul Motion into the studio in 1959. As rewarding as his piano had been on the Davis recording, Evans triumphed with this new rhythm section. He played with what some call a floating pulse by de-emphasizing the beat avoiding the usual vocal phrases of songs and phrasing so as not to start and stop at points that highlight the rhythm of the tune. His touch tended toward the legato, a soft blurring of notes, his left hand often locked together with the right, embedding the melodies within harmony. Such impressionistic piano lines needed sympathetic resonance, and he found it in motion's understated pulse and concern with texture, that's the drummer, Paul Motion, and especially with LaFaro's melodic bass playing free of the timekeeping role. LaFaro tossed out arpeggios and guitar-like flourishes, swirled around the piano's lines, sometimes stated the melody before Evans could play it, sometimes chased after him with echoes of what had just been played on the piano. Evans left a lot of room for a bass to maneuver. And since he did not observe the beat closely, LaFaro did not have to state it and frequently played somewhat free of time. This was a new kind of trio playing, where the beat was often felt rather than heard. So when LaFaro does apply himself to the beat as he does on the bridge, it comes as something of shock, of a shock, and sends the group hurtling forward. A recording like this invites us to refocus our listening habits so as not to hear the piano, not so much so as to hear the piano, not so much, excuse me, as a sort as a storyteller, but as only one part of an inspired group of narrators out of which the story will emerge. Okay, so piano trio, another standard jazz format, just like the saxophonist with the rhythm section, piano, bass, and drums. Now lose the saxophonist. What do we have left? Piano, bass, and drums, a rhythm section, a trio, one of these iconic formations of a typical small jazz ensemble. Sometimes there will be saxophones, trumpets, other instruments, many different kinds, brass of various kinds, woodwinds of various kinds, guitar, this, that, and the other, but very often you will encounter a piano trio. There's a rich tradition of piano trio music in jazz, piano, bass, and drums. There are also rich piano trio traditions in jazz that are piano, bass, and guitar, you know, or harmonic instruments only, or various trios, but piano trio often implies piano plus, ry plus rhythm. Even though piano is part of the rhythm section, it is also the main melodic voice, right? Certainly register-wise, the bass player also plays melodies, can, but register-wise, if you think about where the bass is heard most, it's in the lower registers, the bass registers. Piano is the, ba the, the melodic, main melodic voice because of, not just because of the notes, being able to play the notes, but because of it be able, being able to play the notes in the register, in the octaves, where melody is really heard and registered most. And, and on, on an instrument where it speaks I mean, piano speaks across all the octaves, of course, but when you hear melodies, you think of um, tenor and alto range, soprano range, uh, melodic information as the main melodic information, and, and bass melodies as somehow contrapuntal, as somehow supporting and undergirding, even when they're melodic units themselves. And that is a lot about the new direction of this kind of a piano tree, where the bass player is also playing melodies down low or up high on the bass, which is kind of in the middle range overall. So we, it, we are reconfiguring the way we hear when we hear uh, hierarchical roles um, uh, being redefined. So, uh, as he says, right, piano trios before Bill Evans have usually been less a trio than a pianist accompanied by. This is a hierarch hierarchy-free, pretty much, trio. At least in the popular imagine, uh, not just popular imagination, in the popular understanding of what jazz was in the 19, uh, late 1950s, 1959, 20 years after Coleman Hawkins' so-called state-of-the-art, not so-called because it was state-of-the-art tenor saxophone playing, here's state-of-the-art trio playing in 1959. A lot has happened in jazz from 1939 to 59, as we will see. It says Evans had just recorded "Kind of Blue," the most famous jazz recording, right? Maybe John Coltrane's A Love Supreme, one or the other, almost 
without hyperbole are the two most well-known jazz recordings. One is from 1959, Kind of Blue. One is from 1964, A Love Supreme. Those years are pivotal, as we will see. Anyways, Kind of Blue, critical, small combo, small group jazz, quintet, piano trio plus Miles and Coltrane, plus trumpet and tenor saxophone. Bill Evans was the pianist on, on that record and was a pianist with Miles for a bunch of the 1950s. So he just recorded Kind of Blue with Miles. Shortly before this bassist, Scott LaFaro and drummer Paul Motion, or Modian is how Modian really pronounced it, he's Armenian, um, before they went into the studio in 1959. So there's so much happening here chronologically. We'll talk about this rich transitional moment. Again, the end of the 50s into the early 60s is crucial. Um, but just know that that's the backdrop to where this trio recording comes from. Um, and, and it's saying, you know, that what Evans did with Davis is also vitally important. But what he does here um, is a triumph. He says it triumphs with this new rhythm section. He played with some, uh, what some call a floating pulse by de-emphasizing the beat, avoiding the usual vocal phrases of songs and phrasing so as not to start and stop at points to highlight the rhythm of the tune. Basically, he's saying, they're saying he played impressionistically. It's not so direct what Evans plays. The melodies are not so clear. The harmonies are not simple. The rhythm is opaque, is not so groovy in a certain way. It's in time. It's metered. You can measure it. You can hear the pulse. You hear the melody go by, whether it's the bass playing it or Evans playing it, but it's not rhythmically vital, perhaps, we might say, in the same way. It is rhythmically vital. It's not rhythmically foregrounded. Maybe that's, that's a better way to put it. Rhythm is not un, not less important, but the kind of rhythm that they value is a is a more opaque rhythm and not such a direct, forceful sense of rhythm. Uh, avoiding the usual vocal, so yeah, Evans was was in a lot of ways very. I mean, again, he's a pianist, not a saxophonist, but he was not a pianist who was in his melodic right hand soloing lines trying to play like a saxophonist or like a vocalist or like a. Um, uh, a, a, with a vocal quality necessarily. He was not doing that. In fact, most of there's not very much Bill Evans single line melodies while the left hand comps chords, accompanies the melody, right? A lot of it is these kind of multi-note, densely harmonic melodies, all voices moving in complicated different directions as informed sort of by impressionist uh, composition by WC, Claude Debussy, the French composer of the end of the 19th century uh, and others, uh, as it is by the blues and by, by African-American, earlier African-American proto-jazz forms. It's not that it's about black or white, but it is about sensibility in what you're prioritizing melodically, harmonically, and rhythmically, and how you're presenting those things. So it's not so clear as he plays white, someone plays black, someone plays red, someone plays green, someone plays yellow. No, it's not that. But his tendencies... Uh, as a soloist, Sweat is pointing out, and we hear this, are not to be like, ba 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 da ba you know, so rhythmically foregrounded, so much for dance. This is for some music for perusal, music that's slippery in a way. Describe Hawkins as skating. Well, Evans skates too, but almost imperceptibly, right? He's not cutting up the ice as he skates, if we follow that metaphor further. And that's a good word. His touch tended toward the legato, a soft blurring of notes, right? Smooth delivery, not jagged and angular, say, like Rollins' solo um, in uh, Autumn Nocturne, right? Um, impressionistic, there's that word again, pianalized, needed sympathetic resonance, and he found it in Modian's understated pulse and concern with texture, especially with LaFaro's melodic bass. So we'll address both. Paul Modian, who just died in the last five years, also was a, di a dinosaur who walked the earth until recently long and storied career as a jazz drummer, was a decidedly um, uh, not an opaque drummer, but yeah, sort of a, a, a translucent drummer. Someone whose playing was not easily transcribable. Someone whose rhythms were uh, appropriately groovy when they needed to be, but also were concerned with the texture of how he was striking the drummer, the cymbal, at all times. It was a much about as much about the the painting that he was creating as about the metronome that was marking his paint strokes or anything like that, you know. Um, and same with LaFaro, and perhaps even more, where Modian was understated generally. That's maybe that changed over the course of his career, certainly, but in the context of of this recording, right? LaFaro is 
extroverted in his melodic daring and his weaving around lines and weaving in and out of functional bass playing. Go ding, 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 ding. You start playing a denser, busier, melodic function, conversing with both Evans and Modi, with the pianist and the drummer, having a three-way conversation. That's why we are listening to this already. Is it the oldest jazz around? No. Is it um, definitively one thing that if you once you hear this, then you'll understand the rest? No, but it demarcates a place in the middle of jazz history, more or less chronologically, from about the beginning of the 20th century to about the first decade or two of the 21st, right? It's about the midpoint, and it both harkens to collective improvisation from early jazz, from New Orleans and regional uh, jazz in the South, as, as it was coming up and out of New Orleans and uh, the South in general, coalescing from earlier African-American and uh, folk musics and spirituals alongside uh, military music of the 19th century, uh, popular songs, as we were talking about with Rollins, right? Like, taking all of that jazz came out into the 20th century as a collectively improvised music. The Rise of the Soloist, as I alluded to with uh, Hawkins, came in the 20s with, more or less, with Louis Armstrong and others. And that, here we have a negation in some ways of that idea of a rise of the soloist. By the end of the 50s, there's a reinvestigation of, well, you've taken the soloist plus rhythm section you know, uh, Ulyssian kind of journey, um, or heroic journey, let's say, of the soloist, Ulysses or whomever, right? It's kind of like, I'm on a quest for this perfect solo with my trusty steed and my squire and whatever, soloist plus accompanist, to now we are all soloing together. We are all questing together. So it harkens back to early jazz as much as the actual language of the, what they were playing is mm, state-of-the-art modern, state-of-the-art. There it is again. Uh, what else is here? So yeah, um, right. So there's this, this sense of of people, of musicians playing non-idiomatically, not not playing in ways that the idiom of jazz or the idiom of your instrument, the way one is ex one expects to hear what that instrument functions. So Lafar was playing free of the timekeeping role, tossing out arpeggios, right? The root, the third, and the fifth, the seventh, other chord extensions of the harmony, playing like a pianist or a guitarist, really, in a lot of ways, or a bass guitarist, playing melodically as well as rhythmically and harmonically, um, adventurously, right? Guitar-like flourishes, ring, strums, um, multiple note chords on the bass, you know, double stops and triple stops, all kinds of stuff that is different than foot -dum 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 walking bass, right? Uh, says Evans left a lot of room for bass to maneuver, and since he did not observe the beat closely, Lafaro did not have to state it and frequently played some of free time, right? This was a new kind of trio playing where the beat was often felt rather than heard. So when Lafaro does apply himself, as he does on the bridge, the bridge is the section of harmonic contrast in a song form. So the song form most common to jazz, the 32-bar song form, we'll explore this in following weeks, has a first section of eight bars, a repeating the exact same harmonic structure section of eight bars, that's 16, right? And then the next eight, the B section, or the bridge, varies the harmonic language, the, the underpinning of the melody, varies, contrasts with the A section. So you have A for eight bars, another A for eight bars, B, the bridge, a contrasting section for eight bars, then it comes back to the A section for eight bars. A, A, B, A. Eight times four, 32 bars. What he's saying is, See if you can hear it when you listen. He's playing freely in the A sections. When the bridge comes in, the big contrasting section, he drops in. Ding, 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 ding. Ding, walks a bass line for eight bar five, six, ding, 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 seven, ding, 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 and comes back in the last A section to articulating melodic phrases freely. So he's. It's not that Lafaro can't play functionally. He's just is hearing other things. And so Evans is allowing or valuing his contribution as a, as a melodic voice and a rhythmic voice as a soloist and as an accompanist, right? It's not one or the other. It's now both for everybody. It says a, and in fact, we might say more accurately that it's a soli, that it's a collectively improvised solo statement amongst three instrumentalists the entire time, more or less, rather than this distinctly one person in front, three guys in the back, or three gals in the back, whatever. You know, one one voice out front, three voices supporting that voice. No. 
all voices are in front, all voices are in back, all voices are in the middle, all voices are together, functioning in this sort of slippery way, or a less clearly demarcated way. Accordingly, like this one invites us to refocus our listening habits so as to hear the piano not so much as storyteller, but as only one part of an inspired group of narrators out of which the story will emerge. There we go. There's our third listening selection of the week. A collectively told story, as opposed to two examples of individually aided and abetted stories. There you go. Again, in your discussions and posts for each video, post what you like based on listening, you know, your post should include um, your reflections of what it's like to listen to the selection or watch the selection. Also reflect on what I've said in this brief, in these brief comments about the listening selection. Incorporate those ideas into what you write and into how you respond to each other too and into your own research. So for instance, with Bill Evans Wishcraft, um, whatever you write about in your posts, You have this example, this audio example. You have my words to draw from. Cite them. In the recording at you know minute one and a half when LaFaro does this, it is a good example of that his melodic playing rather than functional or whatever. Um, you also in your post, you know, I was looking into the album that uh, Witchcraft comes from, Portrait and Jazz, uh, and this other track also is a good example. You know, Waltz for Debbie from Portrait and Jazz is also a very good example of the ways in which motion uh, let the time go from minute one to two. You know, cite other things from the Bill Evans trio of this time. Contextualize what your discussions, uh, posts, and responses are based on what I've said here, what you heard, and what your online research turns up. Okay, again, remember, avoid Wikipedia and other un-peer-reviewed um, sources. I'm not saying it ha you don't necessarily have to uh, hit the music library uh, at whichever university library is closest and, and do that, although that would be great. Um, but, you know, it's an online course, of course, so get online and find some uh, in-depth, non-biographical retelling type of source materials to support the stuff you write about. Okay, look forward to this first week of interaction. Um, any questions, comments, please let me know.